it's just hard to comprehend that he's he's missing like this every day it's on your mind for me it is um, that's about biggest part of my day is thinking about where he is and what's happened to him and all that was the father and stepmother of gregory keith mann jr now keith as he's called has been missing for two decades and i've really been racking my brain about what type of cases should i cover in this time since uh, we're not able to go freely out there looking for people at least in in large groups which most search efforts are this case is one that I believe doesn't get cracked with a search effort like that. With as much time as passed, this is about people. This is about this video getting in front of the right person and moving them to do the right thing. So today, we're turning on the searchlight for Keith Mann Jr. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm your host, John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. So with a case like this, we're really trying to focus on a particular audience. We're looking for people that were in a specific area at a specific time. So let's learn about this case and see who we should be targeting in terms of family or friends that might be able to help with this. Uh, this case takes place in Wichita Falls. It's a city in and the county seat of Wichita County, Texas in the United States. According to the 2010 census, it had a population of 104,553 people, making it the 38th most populous city in Texas. So a good amount of people living there. Now we know where we're looking. Let's figure out when. Jumping over to NamUs, here's a profile for Gregory Keith Mann Jr., a white male Caucasian. Date of last contact was May 10th, 1997. This case has been going on a long time and we have a family that still is looking for answers. He went missing at the age of 20. He would currently be 43 years old. Last month, his family I don't think celebrated is the right word, but recognized another birthday of Keith's had come and gone without them knowing where he is. Um, so for critical statistics here, for the height, they have him between five foot six and five foot eight. For weight, between 140 to 170 pounds at the time that he went missing. For the circumstances, we don't get a whole lot. Gregory was last seen on May 10th, 1997. Gregory may go by the name Keith. And most of the media that I've been seeing, um, some of them are completely omitting the name Gregory. Uh, most of it is just saying Keith Mann Jr. So if you do decide to do some searches on your own to look into this case a bit more, that's probably what you want to use. For physical description, brown hair, although in the head hair description it's saying light brown. And I did see some photos of him when he was younger and at times it looked like his hair could get really, really light. Um, so it could be depending on where he's living, how much sun exposure he's getting, that his hair color might be able to shift a bit. Uh, for eye color, they do note that it is blue. For scars and marks, he has a chicken pox scar on his nose. You can see a little bit of a scar on the, on the kind of close to the tip of his nose in some of the photos. And he has a scar on his left earlobe as well. For accessories, uh, he was last seen with a beige baseball cap, cream colored long sleeve button up shirt, blue jeans, brown shoes that were a suede-like material. For additional case information, uh, we don't have a car listed here. There is a car that is part of this story. However, it is quickly recovered, and that's one of the big mysteries in this story is where that car shows up and in the state that it's in. We'll definitely get to that. Jumping over to a website that we don't see a whole lot here on the channel, but on the case I'm covering for Three Men and a Mystery, um, we're coming up on our finale live stream for the case of Elisa Gomez that we've been looking into this season. And we actually have a segment with the director of this organization. This is called Parents of Murdered Children. And they have a write-up here. Um, obviously, for a write-up about Keith to be hosted at a website like this, there is some suspicion that this is a foul play situation. 
I believe this is a letter that was written from his parents and sent in to POMC. Um, they're a really good organization. If you want to learn more about them, check out that live stream for the end of the season of Three Men and a Mystery. I believe it's April 8th, if I recall correctly. Um, and if you want to join us live, where it's going to be hosted over on Gray Hughes Investigates. Uh, let's see what we can learn from this. On Saturday, May 10th, 1997, Keith Mann worked from 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. at Ron Roberts Ford. He had sold two cars that day and planned on delivering one of them on Monday. When he was done, he chose a red 1996 Mustang to drive home. The salesmen are allowed to pick a demo car to use each evening. He asked his boss for a gas voucher to fill up the car because he was out of money. We assume he filled up the car on his way home to his apartment. He had just moved into the Fountain Gate Apartments on Barnett Road about one month before. At home, he proceeded to shower and change clothes. While he was getting ready to go out for the evening with some friends, his fiance, Carrie Kitchens, called at 940 from Dallas, where she was vacationing with her parents. They spoke for a few moments, and before hanging up, Carrie told Keith to expect her the next day around 2 p.m. She was moving to Wichita Falls to live with Keith and already had a job lined up. Uh, her training for that job would actually start on Monday, May 12th. Keith's friends, Chris and Michelle, came by to pick him up in a black Pathfinder. They drove to a FINA gas station on McNeil and Kell Boulevard so that Keith could purchase something to eat using a FINA credit card that belonged to Carrie. So literally, this guy doesn't have five bucks at this point. He's having his friends take him to a gas station where he can use his girlfriend's credit card to grab some food. Uh, we know that's true because they go to McDonald's. He goes to McDonald's with his friends that have picked him up and they go and eat at McDonald's. Uh, there is a surveillance tape that shows them at the gas station. Curiously, I'm not seeing any mention here of a surveillance tape from McDonald's. And I'm kind of curious about that. Um, afterwards, they drove to a place behind Memorial Stadium where they went mudding for about 45 minutes. Next stop was at a car wash to clean up the vehicle. While they were washing it, Keith told Chris that he needed to go home soon because he had to meet someone at 12.15 a.m. He did not say who he was supposed to meet or where. Now, when I first started looking into this, um, I listened to a few podcasts. I'm going to tell you about them by the end, but one of them was Vanished. Of course, Marissa always does an excellent job when she cracks into cases. Um, and there was some other details that I got from her podcast. I'm going to kind of sprinkle it in as we go here. One of the big things is Chris is really the guy that most of our information about this last night comes from. He's the person that is literally the last person to see Keith. Um, so for me personally, I've got just some questions about Chris and some questions about the possibility. Is there something else going on in this story? And Chris isn't being exactly upfront about it. Uh, according to the information that came out on the Vanish podcast, he was given a lie detector test. He did pass that test. He's not really talking to the family anymore to Keith's family and they're kind of frustrated by that, but he does seem to still be cooperating with law enforcement. So it's one of those things where, you know, I don't typically hear of a person, a potential person of interest, like Chris seems to be in this story, being that cooperative in terms of law enforcement and even agreeing to go in for a lie detector test. Now, admittedly, a lot of us have different feelings about lie detector tests and their validity. Um, does that completely write off the possibility that he might be, that he might know more than he's let on here? I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. But there's some really strange things about this story and the way it's pieced together that just make me think it's worth looking in that direction and just being being extra cautious with it and maybe trying to rule it out even harder. Um, obviously, one of the things here is they've got footage of him at a gas station. I think McDonald's, even back in 1997, I'm pretty sure they had security cameras at McDonald's as well. So I'm just curious, is there footage from McDonald's? Is it just not mentioned in this article or is there no footage from McDonald's? Uh, were they able to validate that Chris and Michelle did actually go to McDonald's that night. Um, I, I just I want to keep that possibility open as we're looking through this information because um, 
it's it's something we need to consider. Our, I, whenever I'm looking into cases like this, I'm always thinking about not just the information that is the last known information about the person that's missing, but who that information is coming from. Uh, and there's things about this story in particular that to me feel like if I wanted to cover something up, I might manufacture a story kind of in this way. Um, so that's why I'm a little, I'm just a little bothered by the story that I've heard so far. But let's get into more of the details here. Over at a website called The Missing Man Project, which has a very sweet story uh, be behind its creation. This is kind of the official website for um, Keith Mann's uh, missing page. There's also a Facebook component to it as well. But some details here from the case details page. When he was dropped off at his residence, he was last seen walking up the stairs to his apartment around 1145. He was expecting to receive two paychecks on Monday, May 12th. The Mustang that he had borrowed was later found abandoned near his family's home in the 4300 block of McNeil Avenue. All personal belongings were left behind, including money in his savings account and unclaimed paychecks. Foul play is suspected. Um, so a couple of important points here. We're talking 1997. So cell phone, we don't have it. He does not have a cell phone at this point. Um, on top of that, with what I heard from the Vanish podcast, I believe that where his car was left is actually kind of across the street from where his family lives. Like um, the way his father was describing it, one of his sisters might have been able to look out of her bedroom window and seen where this car was parked. And they also described that Keith used to actually park his car in that same spot where this Mustang was uh, regularly and that the church had asked him to not do that anymore. Um, so it's kind of curious to me because it being parked in the exact same spot kind of shows the likelihood that he parked it there. The family has some questions because they're saying that um, the guy that came from the dealership to pick it up, that you know he would frequently get into cars after Keith had been in them, and Keith was shorter than him, and he would have to adjust the seat. And he's saying when he got into the Mustang this time, he didn't have to adjust the seat at all, and it just it kind of occurred to him that that was strange that usually he has to adjust the seat. So um, a, a few strange things that we have going on here. Why is the car found? so close to his family's home and that's actually a couple miles away from this apartment that he has moved into recently uh, where his friend last saw him um, i don't know but let's let's continue with more details here let's actually put together where all this is going on so here is a map and i know we've got routes that are going all over it but i'll try to make some sense out of this starting at the fountain gate apartment homes this is where he was living. He was only living there for about a month and he had moved out from his family's home to go there. Um, his backstory is uh, he was a baseball player, got a baseball scholarship to go to a junior college, but after a year of it, he just didn't really like it. Uh, so he left junior college, got a, a job at the dealership and was kind of now putting his life together, had recently uh, gotten engaged. His girlfriend was going to move in with him at this apartment. So this is where we're starting, Fountain Gate Apartment Homes. From there, we go to the gas station siding. So uh, the gas station siding is actually close to the freeway, the 277 here. And I don't think the gas station's there anymore. There is a gas station on this side of the freeway, JJ's Fast Stop. So I think it might be this gas station where the siding was. Um, but from there, we go to McDonald's, which uh, his friends have to go get dinner. He's just picked up his. That McDonald's is all the way out here. Um, and then from there, they go to Memorial Stadium to go mudding. And that is way back over here, kind of close to where he lives. Um, from there, he, they go back to his house and they drop him off. And then somehow his vehicle winds up, I believe it's at this church, the St. Mark's United Methodist Church in the parking lot here. And I assume his family lives somewhere on McNeil, just right across from that where they can see that parking spot. So that's kind of the route. Um, I'm a little concerned about just the timing of everything and the direction that everything's going in. I don't know if this is the only McDonald's, but it seems like you're kind of swinging way out in one direction and then coming all the way back. And then ultimately you're going 
close to where his home is. Just in terms of planning, it doesn't seem like the best plan to me. There's a lot of motion going on. And that's what the known things that, that his friends are saying. Hey, we know we went here. We know we went here. We know we went here. There's one additional stop that's not mentioned, and that's the um, car wash. But I don't know where that is. But let's continue with some more information here. Jumping over to charlieproject.org. The vehicle's trunk, when it was found, was partially open. So literally, the trunk is not locked. Uh, the family o opened it, and they saw that a side panel in it was out inside the compartment. Now, uh, I know sometimes if you look in your trunk, you see these little kind of component areas, and they have these panels. Sometimes you open up the panel, and it'll be like you know tools for changing your tire or an emergency kit, or sometimes it's access to like a fuse box or things like that. So apparently, one of those types of panels in the trunk was out of place as well. Uh, there was nothing of his that was discovered inside the Mustang except for an audio cassette that was in the stereo. Uh, another point uh, Marissa, it, when she's speaking to the family, brings up is, you know, where is that audio cassette? The family says they've talked to the police and the police can't find it anymore. They think that they've misplaced it. There was no like message or, or anything like that on the audio cassette. It was just music, but the family's kind of curious, like, you know, maybe we could check into what type of music it was and was that really something that Keith was into or was that audio cassette put in there by someone else? Something along those lines. but. Unfortunately, there's no way to know now because the cassette is missing. Um, the car doors were locked, but the alarm system had been turned off. Man's fiance called his parents during the afternoon and said that she did not believe that he slept at his apartment the previous night. So eventually she makes it to the apartment, goes in there, uh, doesn't find her fiance, and it's her determination. I don't know how, but it's her determination that he didn't sleep there the previous night. Now, something else that is brought up on... The Vanished podcast is three beers. Uh, the story that is told by uh, Chris is that he uh, Keith grabs three beers and then heads upstairs, and that's the last time they see him. Uh, apparently, the beers are found in his apartment. Two of them are on the counter that haven't been opened, and there's another one that's been opened and is about half empty. So his father is assuming that this meant that, you know, he did take the beers, he did go up into his apartment, he probably drank half of one and then left for some reason. But his father also finds it odd that, you know, if you're going to grab three beers and take them up into your apartment, why are you leaving them all on the counter? And especially with the story that he was going to leave and at 1215, he was going to meet someone else. I mean, wouldn't you at least put the other two in the fridge so that when you get back, even if it's a half hour, when you get back later, you can take them out of the fridge and they're actually cold. So um, it's kind of curious to me and it makes me wonder if there's something else once again at play here. I'm also wondering about the timing of the beers making it into the apartment. If we just keep a critical eye, and I'm not trying to say that his friend is certainly involved here, but if we just keep a critical eye towards his story, We've got nothing to verify when those beers actually made it into a, into the apartment. We don't know if that happened at 11.45 at night or if that happened when they originally showed up way earlier in the night before they went and went to the gas station. We know they went to the gas station. They're seen on footage there. Um, I don't know. I don't know. There's just there's other possibilities. This story, to me, doesn't have enough pieces that are supporting it for me to lean on it very hard. And that's really where I'm struggling with it. And uh, I do think that the family should just remain just critical, not not necessarily overbearing about it or judgmental about it, but just, hey, you know, there's pieces of this story that could use uh, some more information to back them or, or to help support them a little better. Over at timesrecordnews.com, this is an article that was reposted. Um, essentially, there's a very strange consideration that we have to think of here. This was 1997. Yes, the internet's around, but not everyone is really using it, especially like nowadays. So his family is kind of behind the ball in terms of technology takes off and starts running in terms of the internet. And their case kind of predated that a little bit, but they get wise to it. Uh, one of his sisters winds up building that website. We're going to get some more information about that. The family has to learn about this and how to engage this thing and open themselves up to their story being shared in all these different places. Um, so they work very hard at doing that and eventually get to the point in about 
it's really over the past few years where it looks like media is really catching on to this story and helping to publicize it. So the Times uh, Record News here does a repost in 2019, I think is when they reposted it. Um, uh, sorry, 2016. But it's a repost of an article from 2002. So this is only five years after he went missing. A Texas investigator has joined the search for a Wichita Falls man who's been missing for nearly five years. A Texas Department of Public Safety investigator has teamed up with city police. Project Find Me accepted man's case within the last month. The new state program accepts 10 high-profile missing and endangered persons cases twice every year out of the approximate 6,500 missing persons cases in the state. Missing persons accepted by the program get their own investigators. Wichita Falls police have been investigating man's disappearance as they would a homicide. Investigators working on the first 10 Find Me cases have already turned up some promising leads. So it's interesting to me that we have this program uh, where there is kind of an outside investigator. And it even says in here that the police have to be willing to cooperate with the outside investigator for Find Me to take that case on. But in this instance, they do have that happen. Now, I don't really see any updates after this, but I do like that there's this system of kind of trying to pick up these cases that might get left behind because um, we're going to find out in, in a later article in this area when it comes to police work, they really don't prioritize these types of cases. Once a case goes cold, it kind of hits the back burner and um, cases that are active get all the attention and then the cold cases kind of get whatever's left over. And, you know, if you look into statistics on police work or if you speak to people that are in this line of work, you know that their active cases uh, take up a lot, if not practically all of their time. So I really like that there was this program to kind of help in that way, um, but I don't really see an outcome that happens there. So we fast forward a number of years. This is an article from April 2016 titled New Hope for Cold Case. And here is an age progression. Um, there's a few age progressions that I've seen that have been done for him. So uh, please keep that in mind as well. Nearly 19 years after Gregory Keith Mann Jr. disappeared, his family still has no answers. It turned us upside down. So it's been really hard, Greg Mann, Keith's father said. Going by his middle name, Keith graduated from Ryder High School and was a good baseball player. He was engaged to be married. His parents said he and his fiance had just moved into an apartment, but on Mother's Day in 1997, something went wrong. They were supposed to come over for a luncheon and bring me a gift, and she called and said, is Keith over there with you? We're like, no, we hadn't seen him since Friday night, Deborah, his stepmother, said. We know somebody knows something, as Father Greg said, but almost two decades later, their hope of finding him alive is dwindling. I want to find him. I don't care. I want to know where he's at, and then we'll figure it out from there. I want to find him. I want to know, his father, Greg, said. The Mann family said the reward for information on Keith's disappearance has reached $8,000 and is expected to rise. And Greg is actually raising an interesting point and kind of a fear for myself uh, when it comes to a case like this. If he is found at this point, and he has indeed been deceased this entire time. The likelihood that you're going to find information that even lets you know how he passed away is extremely low. Um, unless there is, you know, he's, he's found next to a weapon of some kind or something along those lines. Or the weapon has left some type of mark on his skeleton in particular. Those are kind of slim circumstances, and in a lot of cases that I look into here on the channel, we do find bodies and we don't find answers, and I'm worried about that happening in this case. That's part of the reason why I think the exposure is the way to go. Someone out there, and the police are clear about this too, there's a couple comments that they make as well. Someone out there has the information they're looking for. That is going to be much more valuable, even for what Greg is asking for here. If he really wants to know what happened, it's going to take someone finally getting connected with those heartstrings and doing the right thing, looking in the description box below in this video and sending in the information to either the police department or to Crime Stoppers. And of course, Crime Stoppers, you don't have to tell them who they are. You could you can remain anonymous. So there, I, I really think that is the best way for this family 
to understand what's going on in this case. And of course, yes, we want to know where Keith is. We want to be able to bring him home uh, to memorialize him if that's what's necessary. But for what Greg's looking for here, I really get the sense he's looking for the answers. And I don't know that finding Keith without having some component of someone telling where he is or having more information about what happened back in 1997, I just, I'm worried it's not going to give his family what they're really looking for. And here's a photo of his father, Greg, and his stepmother, Deborah, holding a photo of him. This is another article from timesrecordnews.com. Someone's got to know something, said Greg Mann. You've got to act like you're not depressed, he said. I feel like I haven't done enough because he's not here. Um, it's really touching, and if you're interested in learning more about this case, I really recommend that you check out Marissa's work on Vanished and hear the parents talking about it and the things that they're going through, um, trying to watch a movie, and then a movie has a situation of you know someone being kidnapped or something violent happening, and that rattling them, thinking, oh my God, is that what happened to Keith? There's just there's a, there's a lot of different ways fam families are affected by something like this, and. Um, I, I really think that Marissa did a great job, including that with her podcast. When they hadn't heard from him the next day, Deborah and Carrie started to worry. Greg did not. He just went to the lake, Greg had told them. But then when he still wasn't home by Sunday night, they still hadn't heard from him. They always heard from him. That's when Greg knew something was wrong. They made flyers. They placed them around town. Deborah and Greg have asked themselves the same questions over the years. Why was the car Keith was driving, that Ron Roberts Ford red Mustang, parked near their home? The mans had seen it Sunday morning on their way to church, but didn't know that it was the demo vehicle Keith had for the weekend. Did Keith leave it there? Did someone else leave it there? Now, I've looked into a couple of comment threads about this case, and I can see that a lot of people are suggesting there's some type of angle with him selling drugs or meeting up with someone for some kind of reason like that that might not be entirely legal. Uh, maybe that's why the compartment in the trunk was open, because maybe that was the stash for where, where these drugs were kept. And if you allow yourself to go down that line with your train of thought and you're thinking about someone who has access to multiple cars, you know, that possibly could be a decent cover if you are going to be moving drugs in some kind of way. But there's another aspect that really it's it's for me supports that he might have been meeting up with someone he wasn't all too familiar with if he did indeed say hey i want to meet up with you at this church parking lot wouldn't that have been a great way to keep somewhat safe because if something bad went down and his family literally lives across the street all he has to do is yell on the flip side, if his family literally lives across the street and his you know, little sister's bedroom faces the street and she's able to see the parking lot from her window, you know, could she be wondering, hey, what's my brother doing out there in the middle of the night? I can kind of see it working both ways. But the fact that the car is parked in the same spot that he would use when he would go there really, to me, seems to suggest that he's the one that chose that particular location and that he took the car there. And I would say even... With that information that we have from the other guy that worked at the dealership that came to get the car, I've just I've heard that thing too many times about was the car seat moved, and I I do understand that it can be, it can be reasonable to infer that someone else may have been driving the car if the car seat was moved in some way, but it's not a hundred percent. It it really isn't. What's more interesting to me, especially in this case, the exact same spot that he would park his cars in. That's where this car was. That just, for me, makes me believe that it was him that actually drove the car to that location or, at a minimum, was instructing someone else to drive the car to that location. But if that someone else was the stranger, that really doesn't make sense either. Hey, I'm worried about this person that I'm going to meet up with, but I'm going to let him drive my car and I'm just going to jump in the passenger seat. I I, I don't know. There's some things about that that, um, that bother me as well. So I, I just wanted to put that out there. I do feel like there is something to the thought that he might have thought this was some type of safety system, that he could be there at night after his family was in bed, but if something was going seriously wrong, he could hit the alarm on the car or just scream his lungs out and his family would be there within a matter of moments. Um, 
but maybe something happened where he didn't get either of those opportunities. That's kind of what I'm concerned about. Uh, let's let's continue here. Uh, why would Keith leave town without his paychecks? Uh, why was there no trace of him? There's no tire mark squealing away from his apartment, no sign of a struggle, no personal items missing or found in an unusual place. Um, Deborah said, we're private people, but this tragedy has forced them to share more about their lives than they thought they would. And I'm sure the internet has, has really opened that up. One of Keith's sisters, Brittany, as a senior design project, created the Missing Man Project website a Missing Man Project Facebook page and made postcards and business card sized endangered missing person cards to help move Keith's case forward. Social media wasn't as pervasive then as it is now. The Mans didn't even have an email account back then. Brittany incorporated hawks in her designs. Whenever Keith saw a hawk while the family drove to a baseball game, the team would win. For him, the hawk became a sign of good luck. She also included a sports saying the family found on a baseball-shaped form poster board that was made for an athletic banquet. The saying is, whatever it takes. It's what the family will do, whatever it takes, to bring Keith home. Wichita Falls Police Detective Brad Love, who took over Keith's case about a year ago, said, there are different leads we're trying to track down. So far, there never has been anything solid. He has heard many stories about what might have happened, but they're just rumor and speculation, he said. We would like to let the evidence speak. We're open to any tips or information anyone has, especially from anybody that knew Keith Mann, especially in the weeks and months prior to his disappearance. If anyone can remember anything that seemed odd or out of the ordinary, I feel like somebody knows something. Now, everyone's lives are going on. Keith's fiance is now married and has children. His younger sisters, Brittany and Sarah, have grown up, and Deborah and Greg are now grandparents. His parents feel like they've never left 1997. We need to know one way or the other, Deborah said simply. We've been in limbo. We need help, Greg pleads. He knows someone knows something about his son. And I really firmly believe that, and that's definitely why we're here talking about this case right now. Uh, over at newschannel6now.com, 22 years later, every day I get up and spend most of my day thinking about him and where he's at, said Greg Mann, Keith's father. It's really hard, and it doesn't get easier through the years, said his stepmom, Deborah. Keith's father tells us their appreciative detectives are giving the case a fresh look. As police work to uncover new leads, the family continues to do research of their own. Uh, Greg said they watch the news often, and if there are reports of a body being found in town, they go to the scene. It's just It's a heartbreaking cycle that these families go through uh, with this type of stuff. My health is kind of failing me a little bit, so I need to find him very quick, said Greg. Ten more years, I don't know. I need to know now. I do feel like one of these times we will find him. Something is going to happen one of these times. I really feel that said his father, Greg. Over at News 6, again, um, from June 21st, 2019, Crime Stoppers of Wichita Falls has increased a reward for information to $10,000. So once again, if you're sitting on this information, if you need more of an incentive, you can contact Crime Stoppers. You still don't have to tell them who you are. They'll give you a randomized number. You hold on to that number. If you see that this case gets solved, you call them back. Tell them that number. They'll say, yep, that's the one, and you get your money. I mean, that's it's. they, they make it anonymous for a reason. They know sometimes the information is going to come from places where people need to stay protected. So that is a real system. They don't circumvent it in any way. Uh, another article from News Channel 6, this one from August 2019. And this is more about kind of the investigation and, thankfully, a reorganization. Uh, after a reorganization of sorts, the Wichita Falls Police Department is changing the way they investigate cold cases. For the past several years, robberies, homicides, and unattended deaths were a detective's primary assignment. Cold cases came second. For that reason, that routine has now changed. Detective Laughlin is now the cold case detective, and his primary job is to focus on all of the open cases. I want to get answers for the families of the victims, so I'm just going to do the best that I can on each case for those families, said Detective Laughlin. We think it's wonderful that they're going to be able to devote more time to the cold cases, said Deborah Mann, the stepmom of Gregory Keith Mann Jr., 
Our son Keith has been missing, and there are a lot of other cold cases out there that are deserving of this extra attention. I would like people to call in if they have information on Keith and any of the other cases, said Greg. We need to get it solved and know where he is at and what happened to him. I'm really happy to hear that he's um, putting that condition in there too, because uh, like I mentioned, if they just find him, there's a good chance they're not gonna know exactly what happened to him. Uh, so of course, in the links down below, I will include the Missing Man Project. Please check that out. Uh, I'll have the Facebook page also down there. I did also find a different Facebook page for Gregory Keith Mann Jr. It looks like it's really not being updated as recently, but this is an older case. There might be information in there that's helpful if you're gonna dive into this. There is a web sleuths thread. It's only a single page. Uh, not a ton of information here, but if you're really looking to, to dive in more, the Vanished Podcast, uh, episode 128. I'll have a link to that down below. And once again, my hat's off to Marissa and her excellent work. Uh, also, Crime Stoppers in that area has started a podcast as well. It's called Falls Fugitive. Uh, they did an episode. Their premiere episode was actually about this case. You might want to check that out as well. It's only 17 minutes long. And this is the question, where is Keith Mann and what happened to him? And someone out there, everyone is on the same page. Someone out there knows, someone out there has the information. If they've spoken to other people, other people might know. There might be significant others, friends, cellmates. You know, we see all kinds of different sources for where they, these tips come in. Um, sometimes changes in life, having children, losing children, getting married, getting divorced, all those things can affect people that have the information. And this has been a really long and hard waiting game and they deserve for this game to end. And if you are the person with that information, please find it in yourself to do the right thing. Look in the description box below, use one of these methods of contact and send that information in. Give this family some peace. Before I end today's video, I need to thank several people, starting with new patron Marnie Strickland. Thank you so much, Marnie, and Rhiannon Gilreath. On top of that, new patron Top Fives Media. I know you, Top Fives. Um, big fan of your work. Thank you so much for helping to support the channel. I really, really appreciate that. And also PayPal supporter Amanda M. Beard. Thank you all for helping to support the channel, especially in times like this. Uh, speaking of which, Saturday night, we're doing another true crime game time night. So if you missed last week's, you can check that out on replay. You can find it on the channel. But next week, another live one. Uh, it was really fun. There's a way for you guys to actually join in on the game with us. That is super cool. We play Jackbox party games and you're able to jump in and as the audience, you actually affect the outcome of the games that we're playing. So this Saturday night is what I'm calling ladies night. We're gonna bring some of your favorite female true crime personalities onto true crime game time live. And I hope that you will check it out. On top of that, we raise money to donate to Feeding America um, to help people in this really tough time. So please come be a part of that. Take care everyone. I'll see you back here on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch on the Lord and Arts channel.